All right, everybody, hello. My name is Bill Degnan, and I am um, uh, the co-founder of the Kennett Classic Computer Museum. And uh, great, a little closer. Oh, okay, I, I, thought, I thought it was uh, too boomy. Okay, how's that sound, better? Okay, and uh, I'm going to talk through a list of things to do if you were interested in having your own um, computer museum or a similar type of museum. Is there anybody in the audience right now who is interested in having their own museum or considering having a museum or they're just interested in the concept of why would somebody do that? Okay, I'll, t I'll take that as a somewhat interest. Good. Okay. Um, we're located in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, which is near the um, uh, uh, Longwood Gardens in between Philadelphia and Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, this, is a, this is a view of the, the, front or the front entrance to the museum. You can see it's a, a residential uh, neighborhood, commercial neighborhood. Uh, there are maybe 15 uh, restaurants within walking distance, galleries, stores, all kinds of stuff. Um, so to that end, uh, point number one is that you should pick a location um, where you're going to have a steady flow of new visitors who can turn like-minded um, relations, tell like-minded relations about the museum. In other words, you don't know who's going to be in Kennett Square on any given day. And every single day, people wander in to see the museum, but you, um, they aren't necessarily interested in computer history at all. As, as much effort and energy that you put into your museum, this might not be their thing. However, they're going to say to each other, wow, my uncle Jerry would really love to see this place, and so on. So the, the, the opportunity is there to impress the first-time visitors to invite like-minded or hobbyists. And then once, once, you, once you establish yourself, you have more and more of people who are interested in computer history because it's much more fun to do a tour for people who are interested in the subject. Here's a view of the... Uh, the, the entrance to the museum, you can see it's uh, colorful, it's inviting, and it's uh, designed that way so that people who are just wandering by looking at shops and restaurants and touring the, uh, the blocks would find it something interesting. Maybe this is a gift shop, you know, who knows what's in here. This is another view. You can see uh, in the corner there, you can see the Commodore hot sauces and so on. We have a nice little gift shop. Um, second point is to get nonprofit status. Um, it's important that you follow the rules of nonprofit status. Um, and the reason I'm saying it's important to get nonprofit status, you have to choose if you're going to have a museum, how are you going to pay for this? And unless you're independently wealthy, you're going to find out really quickly that if you've chosen a good location, you're going to have to pay a lot of money to be there. So it's very important that you get help. And right away, getting nonprofit status is a wonderful way to do that, to get funding, to do fundraising. But you need to follow the rules. You have to record your donations, and you have to make sure that you have a good tax professional or a lawyer that instructs you for the state that you're going to be doing your museum. This is our registration station. This is a, uh, a um, Silicon Graphics Octane, and it's actually connected to the internet, and it actually has a web page that connects uh, to our server, and it, and it records how many visitors uh, in your party so that guest registration is one of the best ways to prove that you are um, actually doing a service to the community, which is the key to being a nonprofit. So if you have a guest registry when you walk in the door, whether it's paper, we used to have a typewriter. We switch it around a lot. Here's another example. Here's another view. We have it on a, a Next Station, a Next Turbo. Same basic thing. You can register. And uh, then we have a database record of how many visitors came to our museum every single day. And when we have to do reporting, we have that information. The next important point is to show your strength, or know your strengths, and play upon them. In the case of Kennett Classic, we have one of the largest libraries of paper documentation around. I don't want to say in, in the region or in the country, or I don't know, because there's no way of measuring that kind of stuff in a very focused fashion, computers and technology specifically. In other words, there's no, no chaff in there. It's just the just very on topic and relevant information. And this is available to the public to come for doing research purposes. It's organized like a library. But we also can play upon that to do our own research and, and also to use it for materials for pres pr pr like wall art and things like that. Here's an example of something that, that I really like. Uh, we have a collection of proposals that were submitted for um, mainframe computers in the 60s. 
um, from Philip Morris and a couple of other companies like DuPont. What's great about something like this is it compares and contrasts from the eyes of a sales rep who works for a given company the strengths and weaknesses of, the other, of their computers and the other computers they're competing against. And then you can compare and contrast all the proposals to get a really good view of the history of computing as it was then, which is an important aspect to having this paper documentation, because you can see what actually happened, not through the eyes of today's lens of history, but through what was actually happening then. What were the important aspects? Uh, here's another, uh, just more pictures here. We've got plug boards, and you, know, you can see with the documentation alongside. And we, of course, can create our own um, posters, and we, and we do our own scans. Everything you see here in this presentation is from our actual library. Uh, this is a, a, neat, a neat artifact. Uh, this is a great example of how you can use documentation to beef up an exhibit. This is the Electrodata 101. Has anyone heard of the Electrodata 101 from 1951? This computer was one of the very first, and it was a decimal-based computer. And at those tubes that you see there in that um, display are the only real artifacts, other than the, the manual, um, that went, that is, that's known to exist that I know of, unless there's maybe one E101 in existence. But it's a 1951 computer. It was almost a personal computer. But those magnets are so powerful that if they're any closer to each other, they would stick to each other and snap right, in, right together. So it's neat. They're decimal-based um, tubes, uh, logic tubes. And uh, I located these on eBay um, from a seller who didn't know what they were um, you know, and got them really cheaply. But it's, it makes for an interesting exhibit to have um, a way to beef up your artifacts with documentation, or at least the manuals from it. Uh, Burroughs, of course, bought the E101. And that's what the B101 became as Burroughs got into the um, uh, computer business at that same time. Here's another one, Univac uh, uh, 1. Uh, this is a, a very early core memory that we have. Another strength of ours is we have a lot of items that you won't find anywhere in any other museum, despite the fact that we are an indie and small museum. This is a 1,000-bit um, one, one bit, 1, bit me core memory. Um, it's not even diagonally based. It's, it's just uh, horizontal based. And so that's the maximum capacity that you could have for core memory um, uh, of its type. Um, we also have lots of magazines, um, specifically a newspaper specifically about computing from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, including Computer Worlds. Um, we have really interesting computers. This, has anyone ever heard of the SDS Corporation, uh, the, the mainframes? Did you know that some of the engineers left SDS after the company was sold to Xerox? And SDS and Xerox did not protect the name and the logo, so they created their own company called SDS. And they built a 420 computer with twin Percy uh, 299 disk drives and a, a 6502 processor. They lifted uh, BASIC from Microsoft paper tape, and they put it into the operating system. So it's a really rare and interesting computer. And if you come to Kenneth Classic, you'll see it on display. Um, here's some more, uh, more materials, uh, people's computer company, uh, and specialty software, uh, SCO Linux, Boardwatch Magazine. So we, we really have a good organized library of documentation, software, manuals, and so on. Commodore Service Manual, um, some hacking guides. Uh, here's a, uh, the, uh, we, don't have a, we don't have an original Apple I, but we do have an MAI Jolt. Um, if you ever heard of the Jolt, it's the very first 6502 based uh, uh, microcomputer. And uh, we also have the materials from uh, People's Computer Company where uh, students were actually using the Jolt um, for uh, learning how to do computing. Uh, we have uh, one, of, one of the very few Tridex Muse uh, sequencer synthesizers from uh, MIT. It was built um, maybe 1970, 71, 72. And this is where computer music comes from. So when you listen to Mario Brothers and you're wondering where did that sound first appear, the Tridex Muse is one of those examples of TTL logic pre-microprocessor video game music. And you, if you played, uh, you, you, you uh, actually use the um, switches to change the uh, program. It has some sort of artificial intelligence that makes decisions about what to play. Some of the sequences can last for a month before it comes, cycles back around again. It's a really neat device. Um, the Cosmac Micro Kit. This is a, a microprocessor-based micro computer that um, predates the Altair by about six months from RCA. We have one of the very few um, uh, um, uh, data point 3300s that actually work. This is a donation. Um, as, an, as it's about 60 to 70% of the computers in our museum are donations from the community. 
and we promised to restore them and get them up and running again. And Bob Greib, who's a volunteer at the museum, um, and I worked together to actually connect this sucker to the internet at 300 baud 7N1. Um, but a 1969 terminal is about as old as you're going to get uh, connected to the internet. And uh, I'm, I'm very um, I'm, I'm proud of uh, the work that Bob did. He really worked really hard to get this thing up and running again. Uh, this is a CTI, um, a very early PDA from the 70s. Um, before um, uh, the, the, the integrated circuits got smaller, you had to work with something like this, and those have Nixie tubes in them and everything. Um, we have uh, a, another very early terminal called the AlphaCom that was invented out of Southampton, Pennsylvania. We always favor those devices that came from or were invented in our area to make our museum unique. And there's a uh, trainer from, uh, uh, that you might maybe have never seen before, the CompuAd. And that brings me to the next point in, in, in what makes an indie museum successful, is that the story means more than the artifact. And the reason that I'm saying that is we don't have an LGP30 computer. But when you're doing a tour, you can at least talk about the fact that we do actually have a, uh, the timing um, card from it that, that allowed instructions to be um, metered as they go through the, the central processing unit. And we can talk about how that differentiates from that versus an analog computer. And it's an excellent example of not having the computer but being able to tell the story about how this computer um, was used and that BASIC was the, was, this computer was the inspiration to Kimini and Kurtz who um, invented BASIC. This was the computer that they used that said, you know, if we could make this a little bit more friendly, we would be able to um, invent the BASIC programming language. So this is a very historically important artifact. Um, this is uh, IBM 650 work. Um, IBM um, was, one, was a company that initiated the concept of the, um, of the uh, computer science trade versus electrical engineering. And so they donated an IBM 650, or they made it easy for them to purchase an IBM 650 and lease it at Iowa State and other, other universities where that would be the only computer that they would have in the entire state. They named their computer at Iowa the Cyclone. And this, what you're seeing here, is actual work that was done by graduate students. And it was donated to the museum by the, by the, by the, um, the children of the professor who um, actually taught at Iowa State. And this is the printouts. and and, and all of, all of the, the work that was done to um, uh, uh, actually use the 650 and start the concept of the uh, computer science as a major. Um, another interesting story is the Daytech 1000. Has anyone heard of the Daytech 1000 computer? It's another early 6502 based computer from the Philadelphia area. Again, emphasize our area in Philadelphia. Even if you're not from Philadelphia, it, ex it helps illustrate the fact that not everything was happening in Boston and in California in the mid-1970s. And the Daytac 1000 is a great example because MOS is the company that was based right down the road from us, um, right, you know, just north of Route 1. And they made 6502 chips available to students and the universities and clubs. And the PAX Club, which is the Philadelphia Area Computer Society members, got together and created the Daytech 1000. And here's, here's the actual donor who showed up and, uh, and, and presented it. Uh, just walked in and said, you know, I heard you might be interested in this. And we, we got some press in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And that's how um, we, we were discovered by them. There's a picture of it. You can see it looks kind of like an Apple I um, in orientation. It's not an Apple I. It's, it's not as exciting, per se. It's, or maybe it's exciting to me, but it's not as famous. But it's the same concept. Um, we also have an interesting wall in our museum called the What If Wall, and it, and it shows people who were thinking ahead and talking about what was going to happen in computers. And this is a great example from May of 1967, where a gentleman talks about what it would be like to use a computer from your home on a teletype. Um, there's the wall right there. You can see we have a paddle ball system. That works. Speaking of which, most of the things that are in this museum have been opened, worked on, and, and generally speaking can be uh, turned on, or at least we have uh, notes on what needs to be done with them next. Here's an NRI um, uh, model 80, 832. This predates the Kenback by six months. And a lot of people think that Kenback was the first personal computer, but this one actually come, came six months um, before that. And it's a lot of fun sometimes to have a museum to be able to tell a story that kind of breaks the standard um, uh, uh, 
common knowledge that Ken Beck was the first personal computer when this obviously existed more. It's got more of an instruction set. It's got uh, more registers and so forth. Okay. Now, let's say you want to start your own computer museum. My, my first advice, um, next advice, would be to start small and build. Are any of you here exhibitors? Do you have an exhibit? Okay. What, I'm wearing my... my um, Vintage Computer Festival Midwest 2010 or 6.0. Um, every exhibit that this was from that that thing, and we turned it in. I saved it and turned it into an exhibit for the museum. Knowing eventually I want to have a museum, save your exhibits, okay? But it's also important that you save your exhibit, and then you don't ever use any of that stuff again for your next exhibit. Otherwise, you're going to be cannibalizing exhibits. You're going to get nowhere. So we have one. Um, Sinclair exhibit, and this one is specifically designed to illustrate the user group concept, newsletters and such, um, because it's on a thin shelf. I chose the Sinclair because it fits on a thin shelf. So there's a lot of newsletters and a lot of Sinclairs on the wall there. Um, this is a, this, this is a, um, a Heathkit EC1, um, and uh, this is uh, from um, the, the uh, South, Southern, Cal Southern California Computer Society magazine, some artist did this. The original version of it is, is I think, in that magazine, the large, the large picture, so that's where that scan is from. Um, here's another example of uh, something that we brought to uh, the Vintage Computer Festival in Midwest, maybe a year or two after um, six, it was like seven or eight. And because I took a plane, I took my exhibit in my briefcase in my overhead uh, luggage, and so it was a pretty small exhibit. I had a couple Univac um, modules and some documentation, and I set it up on a table, and that's, that's what we have. Here's some more of it. So yeah, I really had to stuff it in carefully. Um, but that's from the Sage computer, um, IBM uh, Stretch and, and 709 and so on. Uh, this is uh, another exhibit we did at the Vintage Computer Festival um, East. Um, it was the anniversary of the IBM PC. Um, I, I like this exhibit because um, uh, the IBM PC at the time wasn't really considered to be vintage. Those of you that listened to a Salam Ismail's talk yesterday, um, they started off where they wouldn't even allow an IBM PC to be in a vintage computer festival. So if you came in 1997 with, a, with an IBM PC, you wouldn't have been allowed to set up on your table. So it was kind of a big deal at the Vintage Computer Festival East a number of years ago to actually have an IBM PC. It was like it was finally its turn to be uh, an exhibit. So. Save that, set that aside, and, and that became another exhibit. We were comparing, contrasting the 68,000 processor with the Intel 8086 processor, and that's why you see the Sage there as well. There's the Sage. Okay, next, have a clearly defined scope that any average person can understand. The people in this audience probably know a lot more about computers than most people know. Most people ever care to know. But the average person should still be able to walk into your museum and say, ah, this is a museum about the. Is if you love video games, this is a museum about video games. This is a an academically oriented museum. It's a library. Is this a pop culture museum where you have computers and video games and you kind of have mixed things mixed together? That is important because if you're all over the place, the audience won't will, won't won't feel as if they're they're grasping on something that they can they can follow as they're going from exhibit to exhibit, because ultimately you're lacing these together in their mind, okay? And um, also it helps you to not, um, uh, it helps you to not have too many weird exhibits. It helps you to stay focused as well, so you know what kinds of exhibits to create a flow. Okay, here's a um, picture of some documentation. Uh, this is a, a neat computer, the Simon computer. Um, we furnished, uh, some of these pictures to the um, Mo Rocca show they showed on TV. Um, so that's where this, uh, if you saw it on TV, those were our slides. Um, here's some plug boards. Um, a lot of this stuff was donated. People just walk in. Each one of these little pieces was a donation and it kind of all got put together into a punch card processing uh, shelf exhibit. Um, it's, it's kind of a lot of fun to do that research, look those things up in the documentation you have, actually look up the part number, and then actually put what it was so that it makes sense and, the, and put, put it you know, on the right shelf in the right exhibit. Anyone know what this one was? Take a guess. Bendix G15. Okay, this is a picture of our PDP-8. It doesn't hurt to have a little bit of art uh, in there, your photography. Um, this is a uh, TV typewriter that was donated. 
with a polymorphic uh, poly88. Here's a view of our um, uh, microcomputing room, so to speak, and this is a view from, from the back where you can see in the back the homebrew era and it's flanked by um, some of the newer 8-bit machines. These are some 16-bit computers and these are some uh, of the newer type, the Vaxes and the Indies and the, uh, the Pentiums and, and so on. Um, next point is to employ an inventory system that allows for easy retrieval and use and storage should, ins should ins ensure long-term preservation. So many of you probably have a lot of computers at your home, okay? And it's important that if you're taking them as a custodians of those computers that you put them in something that's going to preserve them. That if you possible, you put them in air conditioning or at least temperature controlled environment or you store them someplace where they're dry. The worst thing for a computer is for it to be in cold, wet, freezing over and over again, like in a shed or something like that. So you really want to try to avoid that. But you also need an inventory system so that you can find things. Because you might get a computer or an artifact and you might not need it for 10 or 15 years. And you want to be able to go to that spot, know where it is, open up that box or open up that notebook, and it hasn't degraded. So you have to store um, paper items in electrostatically neutral plastic. And you really need to think about these things. What's the point of having a museum if you're just slowly destroying the artifacts? So you can see that some of the more um, delicate uh, books have um, the, the, the electrostatic uh, um, covering on them. And uh, we have, I think we have like 25 IBM PCs. Uh, we furnished uh, the X-Men Apocalypse movie, um, uh, the, the 1983 CIA room. And uh, we actually have our, each IBM PC that's marked which, where it was. In the, and I was on set, and we set up the set and everything. So if you watch X-Men Apocalypse, you can see these computers and which one it was and what, which spot in the room it was. Some, some more manuals. Um, early Lisp, you can see that's Multics, first Multics manual or one of the first ones. Um, there's a GE computer, and on the right is, uh, I forgot which that one is, more pictures. These are just, you know, uh, pictures from our uh, collection that are on display in the museum. This is a funny ad. Okay, I think it's funny. Um, we have, a, we have, a, we have a, a little display dedicated specifically to Digital Equipment Corporation because that's one of my favorite companies. And, of course, we have the newer stuff as well. Um, and I, I believe that there are historical items today. There are historical items 10 years ago. There are historical items 15 years ago. Vintage computing is not 8-bit computers. Vintage computing just means vintage of a particular era. And it's just as important to properly preserve OS2 software and um, uh, um, good, you know, interesting AOL disks with interesting uh, information on them as it is to preserve uh, manuals from the 1950s. Know your audience. How do you classify visitors and how do you address each differently? When a person walks in the door, it's a nice to greet them. It's nice to ask them, are you from out of town? Are you just visiting the area? Because you want to kind of feel out whether or not they're a vintage com a computer or a computer ringer. Um, we're really close to Commodore, where Commodore's headquarters was located. And every once in a while, a Commodore executive or worker will stroll in and just act like he doesn't know what's going on and what, what's there. And you want to be really careful not to you know, act like you know everything. You want to always feel like what, 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 you know, who, you're, who you're talking to. And then when you give a tour, you could take them right over to the Commodore computers, or you could take them to the Apples, or you could take them to the computer music-oriented, or business processing-oriented, or the mini-computer-oriented. Um, areas or the culturally oriented areas so that you're, you're gearing your, um, your tours to the, to the person that you're speaking to or the group that you're speaking to. Also, it's just as important, um, you have to make sure that you realize that not everybody is your age. Um, we are located right by um, a high school, the Kennett Square High School. And so every day the students get out of school and they walk past um, the shop, and every once in a while a student will come in. We also get a lot of uh, volunteers that way, um, but um, they don't know anything about Commodore 64 or Apple II. They've never heard of them. Believe it or not, there are 18, 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds. They, they want to see, the, um, they see the, the 486s. They want to see 
the, um, the XP machines, and, and they are, sometimes they're a little disappointed when they find out that the, the oldest, the newest machine in our collection is from 1997, but we had to make a cutoff somewhere, so that's where we did. Um, this is a, a controller for a, a card sorter, and you can see it's got Nixie tubes. People from our generation that see Nixie tubes all go, Nixie tube. Um, this is some uh, cord modules from the uh, core data, I mean the, um, uh, darn it, it's a 6600 control data. No, not control data, which one is it? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, another thing that's a lot of fun is this is a working uh, PDP-1105 with a teletype. We have basic loaded and core memory. Everybody likes to sit down at a teletype and work with a, a core memory a computer and actually save their work on a, on a paper tape. And I always print it out and let them take the paper tape home with them. And they're always excited about doing something like that. They get to hear what a computer sounded like. They get to smell it. They get to smell the oil. They get to hear the noise of the fans and everything. So knowing your audience is important, but you also need to know which computers are going to be universally popular. And of course, you have to have the stuff that people expect to see. But I resist always and only having those things that are expensive on eBay. But it doesn't hurt to also have those computers um, that, that people expect to see that are historic and that they mean something. Um, some more pictures here. This is a, this, this, this a, a compact with number 44 in it is a, uh, the very first desktop Pentium computer ever sold. It was. Uh, $16,000 in today's dollars. Uh, so if you wanted a Pentium computer in 1993, it was, uh, um, uh, you would have to shell out the equivalent of $16,000. And there's a long story behind this, and I'm going to just move on. But if you're interested, um, part of our tour is to talk about the Pentium and the development of Digital Equipment Corporation in, con uh, in conjunction with Intel and Commodore. I mean, not Commodore, our Compaq, and how the Intel chip came about um, for the Pentium and the, and the demise of DEC. So that's what this is about. And this helps to teach a younger person who may be more familiar with computers from this era why and where DEC came from. Some more pictures. More pictures. These are Sun. That's a Sun laptop called a PowerLite. Um, we also have uh, a collection of um, working um, VAXs and so on. Um, the next tip here is you have one shot to impress. As I had mentioned early, the Uncle Murray would love this place factor. Um, most of the visitors that come to a brand new museum are just going to wander in. They're just going to say, hey, what is this? People don't go to Kenneth Square looking for a computer museum. So you, it's, we're always one degree of separation away from the persons who are really going to enjoy the museum. And so it's important that we impress those people who maybe aren't necessarily impressed by the artifacts, but they are impressed by the museum and the way that it's organized. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of wall art, and we're very careful about um, selecting color and things that are interesting to people, no matter who you would be. This is from a uh, magician's um, uh, like a, a, a newspaper from, uh, from the, I guess, from the uh, early 70s, and it, one of the very first uh, computer covers that has a digital representation of Abraham Lincoln. Here's, here's some IBM 360 display. You see how you lay things out makes a difference. We don't have an entire Var uh, Varian uh, 620, but we do have the front panel, and we can put the manuals up there, and we can put you know, other, other devices and things from the period up to make it look interesting. And then we can talk about it that way. Some of these pictures I absolutely love. These are from a lot of the product brochures. OK, next, visit other museums to get ideas about what you should be putting into your museum. OK, so if you want to create a computer museum, and you're like, you know, I love computer museums, but I'm not as big of a fan of the hierarchy of, of uh, just you know, the milestones of computing kind of thing. I want it to be a little bit more artistic, which is what, what was Karen and, and my goal. So we went to art museums, and we looked at the way that, that um, especially industrial art and, um, and pop art and so on was portrayed in various museums. So we could get ideas about how the spacing was, was, was employed and, and, the, and, the, and the shelving and, and what you put things on and, and how it would look so that um, you, you would get a feeling for what other people seem to be interesting on, interested in and what you were drawn to when you went to that museum. So it doesn't just have to be computer museums. It can be any kind of museums. Um, here's an example. This is kind of an artsy thing. This is our front desk. 
And so I just took a Burroughs 1700 front panel and stuck it in the front. And so when you walk in the museum, you see this as the front desk, and it, it's just neater than having just a, uh, a regular old uh, front desk. Here's some, some, some beautiful uh, Digital Equipment Corporation manual art. This is a bad, uh, I, this, has, this has some nice transistors on it. I think this is a, from a Univac. Okay, next, display should be clean and safe to, to both attract uh, artifacts and the visitors. So in other words, the, the shelving should be secure. I don't know if you've ever heard stories of people whose shelves co collapse in the middle of the night when they're sleeping and their, their prized uh, plastic got destroyed because the weight of it you know, got crushed when the shelf fell. So it's very important that your steps are safe, that you, have, you, know, you follow the rules of OSHA, um, and so on, because if you want to get nonprofit status and you want to get funding and you don't want to get sued, um, you want to make sure that you have it, you know, reasonably safe place, easy to get parking, easy to access, make sure that your museum is, is not off the beaten path and you're going to just get those casual visitors who every so often, and why are, what, what makes Kenneth Square community just as great as any other, we are building a local following of people who love vintage computers right where we are, who had never heard of it before, who come into the museum and help out, and visit, contribute things, and participate in our events that we have every so often. Oh, oh one last thing, oh, two last things. Um, you, ultraviolet is bad for display windows. We actually put ultraviolet shielding on our windows so that the paper artifacts don't get um, bled out. And um, we also don't leave uh, machines running in a, unattended for very long. We do like to have them set up for demos, but they do burst into flames from time to time. So you have to have a, 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 a fire extinguisher in every room. Now, the truth be told, we've never had one actually. We've only had one, maybe two. Um, but it's always been under controlled circumstances where the, rif where the rifa cap goes up, you know what I mean? And a lot of times that's because somebody comes in and donates a computer and they insist that it works and they want to show me how it works. I'm like, all right, fine. So we turn the thing on, it goes right up. So we always make sure, I always say, look, I hope you don't, this doesn't offend you, but we're going we're gonna to turn this on in the parking lot with an extension cord. Um, but that, you, have to, you have to be careful. Okay, here's another exhibit. Uh, this is uh, some more 8 bits. Um, know when to get help. How are we, how are we doing on time? We're doing fine, okay. Know when to get help. Not everybody knows how to make a display, how to give a tour, how to, how to curate an exhibit, how to space things. You may be an expert in your area of expertise. You know S100 computers, you know 8-bit um, computers, whatever, you know. You maybe were a professor, a computer professor somewhere, um, however, however, whatever your strengths are. But you also need to know what your weaknesses are. And if you don't know how to make good displays, Find people who can help you. And Karen here, Karen, the co-founder, she was instrumental in, in, in assisting um, with the decisions about what types of, of chairs and, and enclosures and, and all that stuff would be, the, would be best for the museum and how to do the shelving, how to space things. Um, so she gave me a canvas that I could then put the, artif the first round of, of artifacts together in such a way that it kind of gave me a vision to how, how things might look best, where the colors should go, and so on. So if you, don't, if you don't know everything, which is probably most people, get help. Go to other museums and get, um, uh, get tips, but also volunteer at your other museums. Like if you want to go to Vintage Computer Federation's uh, um, InfoAge uh, uh, Museum, you could volunteer at a docent there, or learn how to do that there. Get yourself used to giving tours, for example, or wherever it is that you live. There's always a museum somewhere that would be happy to have you volunteer once in a while. Um, okay, and this why guess just means, you know, ask for help. Okay, and then I just also want to say that um, our sponsor is Caffeine. And we really wouldn't be able to do this without, um, you know, three or four days in a row of staying awake. Um, to, to get a, a launch for an important event. And so we're really happy that um, we, we, we made a, 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 a really good sponsor. Um, it's a, you know, for the nonprofit, uh, caffeine, just dip your thing in there and just go, you just put it in your soda. Or put it, really, at this point, I put it on my sandwiches and I, I don't think I've been asleep for about three days. Okay, um, lastly, a pleasant environment. Uh, the average person should find your museum convenient to access with good parking. The interior should be clean, not smelly, 
not moldy and not dark. Okay, so your basement might be smelly, moldy, and dark. The places that you live, your house might be smelly, moldy, and dark, but your, but your museum can't be, or people will not come back, and they won't recommend that you stay, uh, that their friends come and visit it. So it's very important that you, um, uh, that, you, that you consider those things, and don't just take your standards on it. Ask yourself, if my... You know, if my grandmother was here or somebody that, you know, I was trying to impress, would they think this place was clean, not moldy, well lit, and so on? You know, is it convenient to park my car and, and actually tour the museum? This is a view from the 8-bit uh, room into the, uh, that, that's the exhibit from, uh, from the Midwest, from Midwest 6 on the right. Um, you can see there's a bunch of different things that have been on exhibit. I think practically every computer that you see um, on these shelves was in an exhibit at some vintage computer festival somewhere. I've done probably about 15 of them. Um, I also did, uh, I taught computer history for a little while at the University of Delaware, and I did exhibits at the University of Delaware, and they're um, in Smith Hall. Um, they have like glass enclosures, and so I work with them to make exhibits. So you can start a museum one exhibit at a time, and that's kind of the underlying theme here, is that you're just not gonna just dump, open the truck after you bought 800 million dollars worth of stuff on eBay and then just dump the truck in there and just unpack everything and just say, okay, museum, come on everybody. It doesn't work that way. You really need to do your legwork and your homework. This is a, a, an example of a, just a, a, a portable computer buyer's guide from like 19, like 86 or 87. These kinds of things are great. Historical guides, I mean, that were current in 1990 or 1986 you know, or 1987 or 77, talking about computers that were cutting edge at the time um, is a very good way to get a, um, some, uh, some uh, um, perspective. The Alto. I have no idea, and I still to this day don't really know the best place to put. I constantly am moving this around all the time. We have some memory boards and some manuals. We don't actually have an Alto. We had a star, but we sold it to uh, Paul Allen um, a number of years ago. Um, here's uh, the 16-bit room, um, and you can see we've got a, a video arcade system set up. I just would like to illustrate it, given I still have time. Um, when parents come with their kids, it's not a bad idea to have a video game someplace in every room. Yes, you might think that you, know, you want to be snobby about computer history, or you want to believe that everybody thinks that it's supposed to be haughty and super accurate and really rare stuff and, and all of that. But the truth is, is that sometimes a kid just wants to sit down and play um, Donkey Kong or something like that. And that gives the parents um, an opportunity to actually take their time and look at things with a little bit more, um, less worry. So we've got an Atari 2600 set up in the 8-bit room that's associated with our Jolt exhibit because the Jolt, the MAI Jolt, was the was the computer that was used as the prototype to create the Atari 2600. So we have an exhibit that illustrates that fact, but it also conveniently is, set, is, is, is positioned so you can sit down and, and you don't care about the jolt, you just want to play uh, Space Invaders. Um, social media. I really, was, I really enjoyed the talk yesterday about social media. There's a lot more people at the social media, uh, the, the 8 bit guys and, and the YouTubers, than there is here today, but that's okay. Um, likes. Followers and all of that does not translate to visitors. Visitors are going to come to your museum because it's convenient or they're really motivated to come. And for every really motivated visitor who drives from 600 miles to come to your, your museum, 50 are going to be from, from your local community. So it's really great to use social media to announce your, your, an event, to build your mailing list, to build a following, but don't expect that's going to bring everybody to your actual museum. It's going to get likes. They're going to say, I wish I could go, like, you know, but that's not the same thing as actually going to your museum and actually donating or um, buying something from the gift shop. Um, the other thing about social media is if you do have a social media account, don't get political. Just stick to the, in other words, let your, let your social media account be for your museum and have your personal one be separated from it. And that is it. Now, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, the rule is have, um, if the computer's turned on, you can use it. So how much do you have uh, trouble with people uh, like having to maintain computers because people are 
going and trying to mess them up or what you know how close do you have to watch people i guess you do have to watch them closely um what there 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 are a number of different types of vis visitors the ones that come in and insist on touching every single computer because they love the tactile feel of the click, click, click sound you know so they immediately just start they start from the very beginning and just start clicking on every keyboard those people you have to get in a friendly fashion and just explain that you know if, if I, I use covid sometimes or I use whatever, but I just say whatever I have to do to make them not do that. But you have to allow computers to be used. You have to allow them to be used, or they're not going to last. So everything needs to be turned on every year. Every computer needs to be turned on, needs to be pulled out of the shelf, and needs to be turned on. It needs to, the capacitors and the resistors and everything need to feel electricity through them. So I don't have a problem with people using computers. The really, really, really delicate computers aren't made, you know, just aren't made available for people to touch. But if somebody walked up to the Altair and started flicking the switches, I would not have a heart attack. Um, and maybe that's just me, but um, I believe that, that that computer should be used. Your exhibit space relative to your storage space. You know, do you have, do you tend to, if you can't have the exhibit space, you, you just, you put it in a small storage, or at what point do you say, I have more in storage than I have in exhibits. You know, how do you make the balance? Okay, that's a very good question. For every computer that you see, we have we have six rooms. Actually, we have we have uh, um, eight rooms in the museum. One of them is an office. One of them is a break room. Um, one of them is the room that we use for the archiving. Um, people bring like eight-inch discs, and they need them backed up and everything. So we have like a like a kind of a, a technical room with with c cables and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, we have five rooms that are actually exhibit rooms and zero storage, practically. So everything is, if it's not, on the, if it's not a part of an exhibit it's, it's, and it's not clean and it's not prepared for exhibit, it's not in the museum. It's, uh, uh, off, uh, off, it's at my house. <laughs> I have, a, I have, I have, a, I have uh, my house, I actually had some, um, some changes made to my house and built uh, like room for there's constantly computers coming and going all the time, so I have a special room that's set off to the side so that I can bring them in and out without them disrupting the house and looking funny. And we also have a very, very large basement. I don't know how many thousand square feet, but everything is very neatly put on shelves and, and organized. And I've got about four or five workshop tables. So all the workshop work is done at home, all the, all the, all the repairs, all that kind of stuff. Because once it goes to the museum, it's just not... It's not conducive to doing repair type work. It, I, I found I, at first, this is the this is what happens with the first three years of a museum. At first, you think oh, I'm going to have workshops. I'm going to, you know, I, I had a green screen painted. I was going to do YouTube videos and all this stuff. But I learned that you really kind of have to focus on the museum itself. And so, if it isn't being used, then it goes back in stores like the boxes. Um, sometimes we have things that work really well, but they're just ugly. So we just need things. We only have the things that, that are present well, uh, and that's it. Yeah. But it's very, very organized, and on a regular basis, he says, oh, I need to get this one out, this one out, and this one out, because part of the keeping it really well is to make sure it gets turned on every year. And he keeps track of what hasn't been turned on, and he pulls it out, puts it on the workbench. And one of the things that, that I insisted on, which seemed to have paid off, was that if you saw like his pictures of the museum, like he doesn't have the piles. You know, so underneath the shelf, there's not piles because it distracts from the people that don't understand what they're walking into. So when you go into his basement, like he is so organized, but the pile, I mean, it's every inch is utilized and it's organized, but that's overwhelming to a visitor who doesn't get it yet. So may, he does a really good job of making choices. And he's also really good because of his system. If someone comes in and says, I want to bring my dad back, and he worked on this computer when he was at IBM or when a lot of people from Commodore, when he was at Commodore, this is it, then Bill will tell them, you know, tell me when you're coming, and I'll bring that one out. And so yeah. like, he can so actually that's specialize the, That's it. the way it works. Also, the other rule is if something comes into the museums, we get a lot of donations, something has to go out. So I give away a lot of stuff. So if you're on the mailing list, which by the way, we have, uh, you can take a sheet if you want to. We, um, first come, first served. We have a free pile and every day there's something for free. Um, but um, it's very important that you have a limit to these things or, or it just gets out of control. 
Any other questions? So I'm, I'm curious about when you talked about how you have the machines on, but they also need to be powered down. I'm sure many of these don't have any sort of power saving mode or, and they take a, a, a good amount of time to, to power up, I'm sure. So I'm curious how you, how you manage that. Well, like I'll give you an example, like a PDP-8. Um, I actually have a UPS unit set up for that. So that, um, um, and there's a sequence of, a shutdown sequence. So that's the kind of thing only I would do or somebody that's actually trained to do it would do. Next. So you mentioned 1997 is your cutoff. I think that's a pretty good cutoff. I remember when I joined the retro computer community, um, I would see people posting about Windows XP and I would think, that's not retro, that's new to me. And now I see people even posting about Windows Vista and even Windows 7 being new. So the reality is time marches relentlessly onwards. Lord of the Rings came out over 20 years ago now. So yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, so I, I just want to ask, as time keeps going, like how do you how do you think about what is your cutoff? Will it move? Will you start to incorporate newer stuff? That's a really good question. Um, the answer is um, when in nineteen when I, I got started in this in, in the, like even really in the eighties and then the early nineties. So what I did was I set aside things I knew were going to be historic but weren't net yet acceptably historic to show, like 386 and 486s. I remember people saying, why are you saving those things, you know? Or why, the time to look for the historic stuff, like, a, like the first Pentium, is not now. It's back when they were getting rid of the things in like 1997, 98, 99, when they were obsolete. So it's very good and very wise to consider the continuum of time and don't just go after the things that are really expensive now. Look at, the, look at if you want to launch a museum in 10 years, let's say, when I retire, I'm going to launch a computer museum, right? Start getting those things together that are going to be in the museum in 10 years. Don't, don't wait, you know, until, until the 10-year period and start gathering them up. So that's a very important point. I didn't make that point, but that's an important point, and I'm glad you asked. Oh, I mean, this one died. Okay, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned the, uh, the the financials a little bit, um, but how does so how does that work? Is it grants? Um, I know you said gift shop, but you know how does it break down? What do you you know? Uh, not necessarily on yours, but in general, how you know uh, how do you manage it, getting it started up and financials and all that? Well, I mean, it, 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 it's expensive to run a museum, so you have to kind of be willing to um, take some sacrifices, personal sacrifices, to to do that. The, the, the gift shop pays the utilities and some of that stuff, um, and uh, it, 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 it's not enough to um, uh, just have a gift shop. But we do archive services. I do a lot of public speaking. There's some movie props, and uh, you know, you can, you can get three or four days, three or four months, um, half a year of uh, rent paid for by the movie prop day. So you just have to be looking for opportunities to use the, um, uh, the use what you have. Try not to sell things. Don't sell your artifacts, use your artifacts wisely. Reading cards, mugs, um, posters, uh, we have um, um, uh, mouse pads, you know, all kinds of things with our original thing. And I was going to add too, like if you're building it, it's not about size. Size doesn't matter. Like if you're really small because it's what you can afford, you become part of the community, and then the community can be invested in helping you keep it on. Which is where the point where kind of classic is, is that the community doesn't want to lose it. So as rents go up and things like that. But the other thing that I've always said about the gift shop is that that the gift shop you're not going to get rich off the gift shop. But a museum without a gift shop doesn't, 
exists the same. The, the nice thing for some people who walk in who don't know what they're looking at, the comfort of, let me go look at these mugs. Like you're not gonna make your, your, your business off the mugs, but people, when they feel like they can walk in and look at a set of cards or mugs, I mean, they might buy one to leave, but it gives them the in to come in, like you, you, some of those expectations. So it's to scale, like don't have more gifts than you have artifacts, but, but they're all important components. And, and, and then people start to appreciate you for that. So we're hoping now to get rid of the nonprofit status is going to start. Basically, you plan the home, you prove that you do a community service, you prove that you got something, and then you're there, and you're serious, and then you then the donations start to come in. So just take a little so bit of time. So it's like, it, it, some of it is through just individual donations, or oh, yeah. do you the, the, solicit people them? Donate, or people donate, they, they visit the museum, and they say, let them know what I'm buying from them, and you know, which should be a Oh, but you don't solicit like from community or larger donations from companies. Or we, we are, we're, that's, that's, that's a stage right now. Okay. We're, we're not at a stage where you're the word going through the nonprofits and building the word and, and all that. And I've been through that process before. I was a co founder of the Vintage Computer Federation called March. I was one of the co founders of that. I was also a public established that museum. And the code was established in the museum really there. So I've already been through the process of creating a museum and going to the nonprofits then. I was more interested in the workshops and actually repairing the computers at the time. I um, wasn't as interested in the museum because I didn't live very close by. But one of my goals after I left the Vintage Computer Federation board was to start Canada Classics because it was close to my house. I couldn't keep driving to New Jersey all the time from where I lived in uh, Pennsylvania. So that's kind of the, where it came from. And I actually also had a computer museum in Wilmington as well. The mayor came out. and. So this is the first museum that's set up, so that, 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 that's part of why I have a little more confidence. You know, you just need to do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and it'll work. You know, that's, 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 uh, and the smaller serious. towns that have libraries, like you can, you know, ask for a space. They're always looking for things to exhibit, so you can start getting yourself known. If you've done a good exhibit here or somewhere else, like it just, you know, that, that's really good. Point. I forgot to mention that as well. Um, you don't. You can volunteer to make an exhibit in the library, or maybe you can collaborate with somebody who's trying to start a coffee shop and create a computer history themed coffee shop. You know, you don't have to make a museum just a pure museum. You can make something that you can afford. You can volunteer to um, bring an exhibit, a permanent exhibit, to some community center that has a display case someplace. It doesn't have to be a full big one other thing. Well, Ken Classic is what. Karen and I and volunteers and our budget and the community support. It's pretty big though. I mean, it's a pretty big place, but it's not anything like the Peer History Museum in California. But it's neat to have a community museum. It's neat to be able to do it your own way. It's neat to be able to have a little bit of freedom to do things the way you want to do them, and present history in the way you want to do it with a local focus. There has never been a soul that has come into this smaller museum going, oh, well, this is so small compared to. We don't get compared. It's just they're fascinating. Everybody walks in and recognizes something from their history or their past, and and then you've got them. And so it's not about competing. It's not about wanting to be like someone else. Be who you are and your strengths, like what Bill said. And you have to be there every day. I'm, I'm there five days a week, um, open on Tuesday through Saturday. Sometimes Monday. We have time for one more question.
specifically illustrate graphical user interface computers and workstations, things like Next and SGI and, and Fax Station and stuff like that, um, early Pentium, uh, PS2, um, Windows 3.11, stuff like that, that I kind of consider isn't really um, vintage at all for me, because that's the stuff I used in the beginning of my career, so to me it just makes me feel old. But the truth is, is that it's, uh, it, it's, that's the most important lesson that I learned. All right, thanks everyone. If you want to fly, please come, uh, come up on the room.